tonight, <clears throat> I want to play with an idea. And the idea quite simply is modern man no longer uses the term cause. Since he no longer uses the idea of cause, he cannot really come to grips with the most important issues. Now, I'd like to start this exploration on the search for the cause based upon Plato's Phaedo. But first, what is a cause? Normal idea of a cause, a cause must be an agent that produces an effect or some result. Curious definition because you could equally say a cause is that which produces an effect. Therefore, it's a poor definition. But this comes out of standard dictionaries, and that's what I decided to use just to play with it for a few minutes. Now, I'm going to go through just quickly a couple of classic principles of causes in order to put them out of the way and give us a vocabulary. These are the classic four causes of Aristotle and it's the acronym is MIF, right? M-E-F-F, -F, MIF. If you have a barn, right, you must first have the material. Right, have the must have all the material present too. The wood, the roof materials, nails, all of those things. That's the material cause. So you can say, the cause of the barn being there, why on one level it's a material cause must be present. So if I ask, what is the cause of the barn? I could say, well, there's a material cause and these are the materials. Just because you have the materials doesn't mean it will come into existence. You must have an efficient cause, a workman, or someone or something that puts them together. That's called an efficient cause. So we have a material cause, an efficient cause, but even though you have workmen and materials, you can't do anything unless you have some plan some idea of what you're going to be making. And that's called the formal cause. And that's our blueprint, as it were, of our barn. Now, just because you have the blueprint or the plan or the idea, and workmen or the efficient cause and materials, you need something else. You need what is often described as it must satisfy someone's need, you have to have a need, or in a language that expresses it best, there must be something that for the sake of which it came into existence. That's usually the way it's described. That's the fourth cause. That's called the final cause. That for the sake of which it came into existence. Someone has to need it. Someone has to require it. Then, if that's the case, the plans, the efficient workmen, material all come together. Now you can say there's a cause for the barn. There's something, however, that I'd like to mention now there's a lot of energy that takes place bringing this into existence. Right? There's some energy in the making. Right, in the making. Yeah. 
So what do we have? We have four causes of Aristotle. We can talk about causes now in terms of this model. But now I want to move and show why the idea of cause in the modern world is empty. I want to just quickly go over the idea that sense experience in respect to this issue of cause and effect is dumb and silent. That's where we're going. All right, let's do it. Which comes first, cause or effect? Obviously. Then, the effect. Now, in terms of what we have been taught, all right, in terms of our experience, in terms of our experience, in terms of what we see, what we learn through the senses, do you ever experience the cause when it's a cause? Let me do it again, all right? <clears throat> do we ever experience a cause when it's a cause? Watch, I'll do it for you with this beautiful piece of chalk. Here it goes, ready? Do you see the cause or do you see the effect? Do you we ever see the effect, right. we see the effect? Do you ever see a cause no. when it's a cause? Never. Never. No, because it hadn't done anything. <laughs> well, <laughs> is that right? It's not visible. It can't be a cause unless it then does something. You can't see it. With the eyes. You can't see it. <laughs> I cannot see it. If he dr drops into the ground uh, some seeds, as you can see in this beautiful picture, does he know when he puts the seeds in the ground that they will in fact germinate? No. Or does he have to wait for the effect? He has to wait. He must wait for the effect before he can say that those seeds are germinating. Ah. Ah, now look. It's undoubtedly true, though, that because we've seen and heard of people doing this countless times, that there's an expectation that if you put a number of seeds in the ground, something's going to germinate and generate plants, right? There is an expectation. The expectation is nothing more than under similar circumstances we expect similar results and that's the whole of it, isn't it? Well, if that's the case then, let me push the implications of that. If you're guided by, if you're guided by empirical thinking, that is to say everything you want to say must be traced back to something empirical, then you have never had an experience of a cause when it's a cause. Therefore, in terms of empirical understanding, knowledge through the senses, do you know, now watch, do you know that it will produce a mark the next time I do this? Or is there a possibility that this chalk may have some hard surface there that will not make an impression such as it did before. You Is that possible? You sure. might not move it. You might not press it. Or a number of things might occur. Sure. So we try to keep all the variables down so there's only one or two present, but would you agree? Ah, oh, it did it again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But do I know what will occur next time? No. Or do I have a high expectation that will occur again? Very high. 
have uh, expectations. Yeah. But that is not knowing. No. That's hoping. <laughs> Expectation is hoping. Now look what this does now. Look here, see? Let's argue this way. Suppose I say, I doubt there's any legitimacy to the idea of up. But we can still have down. You would say, no. if you do away with one, you must do away with the other. <coughs> Wait a minute now, look here. If the idea of effect is a term which is defined in terms of cause, if the effect is defined in cause, the cause is defined in effect, they're correlative terms. But if you have no knowledge or experience of the one, then you don't know what you're talking about when you use the idea of cause. Can you still use the word effect? No. Not legitimately. That's the trouble with positive thinking. I'm trying to eliminate the negative. <laughs> <laughs> so wait a minute. If we base our thinking on what's called empirical evidence, then can we say that we know a cause? No, because you never experience it, you never experience it through the senses, and all you experience are, wait a minute, but how do you know it's an effect? If effect is defined in terms of a cause, and you have no experience of cause, well, and how do you get the idea of an effect? If one goes, the other is equally suspicious and must fall. If we mean that the effect of planting seeds, the effect of it, uh-uh, I'm assuming there's a cause. I'm assuming, therefore, the legitimacy to the idea of cause. Therefore, for what moderns do in such a case is they come up with a wonderful word and they say, I will no longer use the word cause and effect, I will use the idea of probability. There's a probability, there's a high probability, therefore we don't have to use the idea of cause and effect, and all we have to do now is look for correlations between things, and then express that as a probability, and we can avoid the whole term cause and effect. That's right, that's the way moderns go, that's the way we've been taught. Therefore. Which comes first, cause or effect? Cause. No, it can't. I mean, you wouldn't know it was a cause unless you... <laughs> yeah, they'd have to come together. You have to experience a cause before you know there's an effect. Yeah. It can't be. Did you ever experience a cause? No. It was in myself. Ah, but not empirical. No, not empirical. Not empirical, ah. Not true. Ah. Now, if someone were to say they experience it in themselves, like this, say, here I am, I'm going to will this. <laughs> I did it. I control it. Cause and effect. Wait a minute, do I know the next time I order my hand to uh, separate the fingers here that it necessarily will do so? Might there be all kinds of ph physiological problems that may intercede at this point and block this? But is, is, it, is it a certainty? No. Certainty. Is there a certainty? Are we back with expectation probability? If we know the odds are a million to one, I would say certainly bet on it. But in terms of knowing, can we establish the idea that there is a cause and effect that we are in control of internally? Ah, look here then. That sense experience is dumb and must be silent and can say nothing about cause and effect because he can't experience it. Well then, if no experience, then both cause and effect are empty. Mmm. Now, oh, wait, well, this is interesting indeed. Look here. We use the example now of seeds. I want to move now to the cookbook. Would you agree that you can use a cookbook 
and it will tell you how to arrange a whole number of things together and, and to create these things, uh, not create, but you put these things together in a certain way and then treat them to heat or treat them with cold, then some consequence results. Right. That's the cookbook. That's a cookbook. Now, would you say, therefore, the way we look at cooking, the cook, what I'm calling cookbook cooking, right, based upon following recipes, would you say then you're coming to grips with a cause? Is there a cause in that? Are you doing it? You're the agent. Yeah. Because yeah. if you don't put enough of this or enough of that. Oh, by the way, do you know the result, the effect will naturally occur before it comes out of the oven? Whether well, it freezes? Is there a probability that it may not? A small one, but yes. Oh. Oh. But in spite of that, would you not agree, transformations do take place. Those things do go through a transformation. And would you agree not only that, but those particular things coming together have to come together in a certain way, in a certain sequence, at a certain time? Or would you say, oh, no, no, no. What you do is you take all the things and dump them into a mixer and out it comes to the mix, that's all you need to do, and then throw in a match, no. Throw in right? a match? So, <laughs> right here. so, there's something curious that's going on. Transformations take place, but yet we are obliged to pause before we use the idea of cause and effect. Or, here's our crisis now, all right? Here's our crisis. We only have a problem if we want to base our thinking on the empirical model. That's the crisis. That's the crisis. Because somehow, in some strange way, these transformations that go on processes go on, things form themselves through processes, they're directed in a certain way, but you can't say you see or experience the cause. As a matter of fact, you can't say you experience the effect either because you don't know it is the effect of whatever it is you're doing. High probability, but you don't know it. So let's even push it a little bit further. A little bit further. I want this line now to represent processes. Processes. That can be all the elements of a cake coming together, being transformed in the process and emerging out comes a cake. But then would you not agree, anything that exists in this room, uh, if we were to look at it uh, over a span of time, consider the span of time greater and greater as we proceed in our discussion, that it's likely that if we stood here under these circumstances for a certain length of time, everything would change and age and decay and there'd be other things taking their place. So everything is in a process of transformation. Everything. Everything. Yet, in this process of transformation, at any time, there are particular forms that take particular shapes take place of many things that seem to have a stability over a period of time. Even though within each of these things they are transformations, 
things are added, things are subtracted, and yet the form seems to endure for a certain period of time. Yet within the whole span of time, it, even the forms change. And that's our reality. Forms and processes. Ah, ah. There are a couple of questions now we can ask, right? I have three. Anything that we say that has a form, our bodies, our being here, is a mystery. It is a genuine mystery. Is it meaningful to ask, why does it exist? Why did it come into existence? Why did it go through the transformations and be destroyed? Well, astronomy is, uh, goes into that. Astronomy. Yes. They say the sun was first, and that's why we have the Earth. They yeah. calculated through uh, going back in time. The only place we play this game is in cosmology, isn't it? In the subatomic world, we don't. We don't for an interesting reason, and maybe I'll get there quick. Should I get there or not? No, 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 no. I'll do it now. Going back to the recipe. Here it is. This is a very strange principle, and I always enjoy talking about it. In any subject, you can only talk about the things beneath the thing you are interested in and never the thing you are interested in. Right, I'll make that clear. Right, let me do it again. Right? Any subject that you are interested in, you will never be able to understand it if you study the subject you're interested in. because the thing that you are going to be studying belongs to something higher than the subject you are interested in. Okay, let's see if I can do that now. The chair. If I want to study chairs, right, if I want to study a chair, I'm obliged to study its parts, am I not? If I want to study the human body, I'm going to be studying its parts, am I not? If I study the parts, I'm going to have to see how they are connected, joined, under what conditions the chance transformations within the body take place. Wait a minute. I'm now I am no longer studying the body, I'm studying its parts. Is that right? In a sense. In what sense? <laughs> That's the only way you can do it. Huh? Uh, sure. you have to do it Anything you're interested in, never study the thing you're interested in because you'll never understand it. Here's the principle. So it, you see this preeminently in science. Anything you want to study, the way you study it is you want to find out what are the parts that make it up. Whatever you're studying, you want to see the parts, and how the parts are joined, what keeps them together, and how they fall apart. That's essentially science. So whatever you're studying, no matter how small it is, you always have to have something that can break it into smaller parts, so you can see its legitimate parts. Therefore, if you want to study this, you don't study this, you study its parts, and how the parts combine, join, and separate. Wait a minute. Then you're not studying the particular thing you're interested in. Right, that's Western medicine. Western medicine. That's right. That's Western medicine. That's this. And that's why that new branch is so interesting and vital, holistic medicine. Right. Let's take it as a whole. That's right. New kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. So that, <clears throat> see, once you're exploring something in terms of parts to whole, you're no longer exploring the thing and its causes. Right. Science becomes more and more fragmented. It has to, yeah. doesn't it? 
and then you have to have something stronger and stronger and harder and harder to smack the smaller smaller thing and just so that you can then study its legitimate parts. Yeah, 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 quite true, see? Now, look here. That means if you want to study, if you want to study something holistically, you have to study it across, don't you? You have to study it in terms of others. Your study now must be man. If you want to study the part, you'll lose it. So therefore, the part to hold is a very interesting dialectic. Anything that you want to study, you're going to be studying its parts. Therefore, if you really want to study it, you must go to the next higher class. Then you can study it as a part of a higher class. When you break things down into the parts, whole and parts, you're no longer exploring causes and effects. You're no longer exploring causes and effects. You're not exploring the question of why it exists. Right. It, why did it come into existence? Why is it destroyed? All the whys are gone. All the why questions are gone. And in its place you have a new one. How? How do the parts of a whole function together? Why did it come into existence? No, 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 no. How do the parts of a whole, how do they come together? See, come together, no longer into existence. How do they come together? How they function. That's right. How they function. No longer wise, that's out. All out. Therefore, we have no dialogue to explore these higher level questions because we're approaching it in this rather curious way that we always lose the thing we're studying by studying it in the lower class of which our most of which our interest is in the higher. Now look here. What is, what, what, suppose someone were to say, look here, there is sufficient evidence that there is order through this process and transformation. That forms reappear with great regularity. The forms themselves are intelligible. They have pattern design, structure, etc., and function. Well, then it looks like there must be then some mind at work behind it all. Now, if mind arranges and causes all things, if we want to say that, if we want to go on to that level, you see, because we're going to have to talk about what whole can we study that will make the particular thing we're interested in its legitimate part? So if I ask why, 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 whys presuppose reason. You don't need the word why, you can ask what is the reason for? What is the reason for? a thing existing. That, see, the why presupposes reasons. And the only thing that has reasons are minds. So if you legitimately inquire into why does it exist, why do you exist, if you push the why question, you are really asking what is the reason for? And the only things that have reasons are minds. Therefore, you cannot escape the question, if you think a why is legitimate, that you have to go into looking for the reasons for something that crosses nature, goes across all the forms of nature. Once you start looking for the reason why things are the way they are, to the degree to which they are intelligible, you are going to, hypostate, you are going to postulate the existence of some kind of mind in nature. Ordering nature, Right. Whether it's, I didn't mean to say it's in it as an intrinsic quality, though that it might be there. But right now, just to say that if you're exploring this question legitimately, you're up against the question of mind, the intelligibility. Let's go a step further. 
That's still not the issue. That's still not the issue. You see, because once you talk about mind at work, you can still ask, why does the mind put things where it does, how it does, etc.? Why? You still have to the why. Pardon me? Mind isn't the only solution. Go ahead. The, the idea that everything can start as a seed. Mm -hmm. and the seed just evolves, and just like you find a seed and it just starts to uh, blossom. Why, sure. In its own way. It doesn't need any mind. It has an intrinsic uh, intelligence. If, but if it has an intrinsic order, yeah. what's the cause of its intrinsic order? <laughs> you see, that's you see where this is the issue. You see, wherever you see, wherever you see an uh, order, patterns, symmetry, harmony, balance, that's elements of rationality. That's elements of intelligibility. Those things that occur whenever they occur in the presence of mind. That's the step we don't want to make in our culture. That's the difficult step because that's into metaphysics. And it doesn't make any sense to us. How can there be mind apart from, from a, a living thing that has the mind? Because we, we identify mind and brain as one. Uh-oh, this is not, this is not. Hearing, right? Hearing, it, hearing is not accomplished by the ear, but it's through the ear. The eye doesn't see, it's through the eye that sight takes place. It's through the mind that intelligibility is an evidence. So that if you ask, therefore, why you're involved in reasons, if you ask for what does these kinds of things called reason, you're talking about mind. If you're talking about mind at work, a moment ago we said that's not sufficient. Why isn't it sufficient? Because if mind is really at work, then whatever forms emerge have to emerge as a consequence of a natural order. Therefore, everything has to be where it should be if there is intelligibility. Uh-oh. Best. You can't avoid it, can you? If mind is operating, then things should appear with a certain intelligibility appropriate to its circumstances, appropriate to the transformative powers that are at work. And therefore, it must follow that mind then would place everything where it is proper, best. That's where the logic goes, which we are repelled to consider because our age is, it hesitates before it gives credence to metaphysics. But now, this is curious, you see. The search for causes then leads us if we pursue it along this kind of exploration to postulate mind and if mind, we have to postulate best and proper. Proper for the circumstance, proper in every, in every respect. Well, let me take a moment out, all right? And add one more thing, okay? Uh, here it is. Oh yes, I hope you hold it just for one second because I want to go right there, all right? What do I mean by best? Everything should be exactly where it is, best for it to be. And if everything is exactly where it should be, where it's best for it to be, that's a concept of justice. And it's just for it to be where it is best for it to be under the circumstances such that it exists the way it is. Yes. Go back to your point. Yes. Mind. 
you know, so people have all these different ideas of mind, like people are trying to use their minds to manipulate the world, the other mind, like mm -hmm. the positive thinkers or the Christian scientists. Mm -hmm. They're trying to use their minds mm -hmm. to manipulate. They say there's some uh, subconscious or thing, and they're using their mind to, mm -hmm. they're becoming God's life. Mm -hmm. They are deciding how things should be through their own uh, idea of what they think is best, usually for themselves. Mm -hmm. So then you have manipulation That's, cert going. that's certainly true. But the question we have is whether or not that's the way this term is being used. I like the word intelligence there. Okay. All right. So do I, by the way. All right. If you say intelligence is at work, yeah. all right, uh, then there must be something that is intelligible. for it to exhibit intelligence. And then there must be some power at work for something intelligible to manifest in some way intelligence. And it can only do that through a intellect. Not necessarily. <laughs> Try it. There is there's something within us that's beyond the intellect. Oh, certainly. Oh, abs without a doubt. Is there something spontaneous that happens? Uh, I would certainly agree with you. But I thought you were going to hesitate on the word intellect. Yeah. Yes, I would agree that we can go beyond this and find something higher than this. That's true. Yeah. But if we say that there is this kind of exploration and have these kinds of ideas taking their, their uh, point of development in the way in which we were exploring them, we can give up the idea of mind and talk about intelligence. We talk about intelligence, must we not talk about something intelligible? And if there's intelligence at functioning through any kind of power that presupposes intellect because the way in which intelligence functions is intellect, through intellect. Some animals don't have what we consider an intellect, and they function very fine, very well. Oh, you're quite right. See, um, this so in nature, in nature, right, um, everything is interconnected. Everything is interconnected. Everything is interconnected in a high degree. And its interconnection does show a great deal of intelligence in nature. That's right. Above, in that line, there is man. Now, he has a degree of freedom. He has a degree of freedom. He's only partially in nature. Because he can, he, there's a part of him if he can awaken it. Right? And intelligence is not what's measured in IQ test, obviously. We must get a better look at what we mean by intelligence, intellect, and the, in, and, uh, uh, the intelligible. All right, let's do it. Uh, There's something in the paper recently talking about, uh, it's not the IQ, it's the emotional intelligence they're talking about now. People become successful not because they're so brilliant mentally, but sometimes they have an emotional uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, togetherness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's do this. Now, let's first make sure what I mean when I say on the level of nature and the level of, on the level of things that everything should be exactly where it is and it's best for it to be the way it is. I'm going to use this chalk. All right? This chalk has been used in a variety of ways. Every single part of it all the transformations it has gone through have left its mark. Every single thing about this, every mark is a proportionate to the power and the forces that have been brought together to that bring about, that have brought about those changes. It is perfect. 
It is perfectly what it is. All the changes that have gone through it, all the, all the changes it has gone through are precisely the way it should be for the changes that have affected it. No more, no less. It's exactly, perfectly what it should be, exactly what it is. And that's for everything in the universe, isn't it? <clears throat> We're dealing on the level of things for a moment. We're dealing with the level of things. Now, when we apply that logic to the realm of man, then we are saying that all the changes you have gone through, wherever and however, equally, it has molded and shaped you to be exactly what you are, the way you are. Now we're going one more step. <laughs> we have to go the next step, and that's what's most interesting, you see. Because this is just saying that the universe is so is so perfectly structured mechanically that everything is a series of forces and pushes and pulls and therefore everything leaves a proportionate mark on things. But now when we use this word best, we're going to add something to this image. And now we have to say it is best for it to have had those changes. It is best for it to have suffered those changes. Now, this is the great riddle of Dostoevsky, isn't it? Right, that great question that's asked in Dostoevsky. If you could bring about a perfectly ideal society, perfectly ideal, in every way, but it cost uh, two million lives, would it be worth it? Hmm? Miss? <laughs> if it cost one life? <laughs> Perfectly just. Last for thousands of years. Perfectly just society. Mm. That would be a dilemma. Go ahead. How many? <laughs> How many will we sacrifice? Just Four million? Based on, Two million? On, on injustice. One million? What do we mean by that? See, Dostoevsky goes a step further and he says, if it costs even one tear of an innocent child, it is unjust. No, I don't know whether you like that kind of argument, you see, but look here. It raises this issue, doesn't it? Uh, if it raises this issue, that's the door that opens into philosophy. That's the doorway. This is the problem. That's the whole problem. Because would you not agree, there are some people, there are some people, let us say these effects have occurred to have produced this person the way they are, and others go through unscathed. And that is unjust. It's unjust. Seems that way. Absolutely. Uh-oh. In other words, the evidence that we find everywhere is that it is not best. Maybe for things, mechanical things, you can do that, but not in the realm of the mind, in the realm of humans. Agree? Yeah. Good. We have all these wars in the name of somebody, what somebody thinks is the best. That's right. Always. Always. Yes. They always think that their the war is necessary to, uh, to create the society that they want. Okay, now try this. If this really is best for things to be this different one from the other, let me put it this way. If it is best 
for so many things to appear unjust then how are we going to save it? How are we going to save it? That's all. How are we going to save it? In the face of monstrous suffering, certainly the 20th century has had it. A recent book, a great book, which I like recommending, it's now out in paperback. It's the 20th century book of the dead. Oh, really? Is that 20th, century? 20th century book of the dead. What this author has done, all right, is all he's done is lists all the wars in the 20th century. That's all he does. Long list all over the world. And next to each war, he puts the number of casualties. That's all he does. Huge, enormous number of people killed during times of war. War being defined as one state fighting another state. Right? Conflict between states. Oh, by the way, he makes another table. I'll put it over here. The total number of people destroyed by their own governments during times of peace. Here it is, right? Times of peace. Number of people killed by their own governments. Which one is greater? The last one, I think. More people have died in the 20th century as killed by their own governments than people have died during all the wars in the 20th century. Sure, we just raise the Therefore, where would you, at what times would you have a greater chance for life? War. Wars. <laughs> yeah, we just raise the speed limit. Now, he did this, right? What's the name of the book? 20th Century Book of the Dead. He did the book. Enormous, terrible book. Now, wait a minute, go back now. What do we have to construct to, in spite of that, say there must be, it must be the way it is and it's best for it to be exactly the way it is. It's best for it to be the way it is. What do you have to do What do you have to do? Well, removing the appearance and getting to reality. It is best for so many things to be unjust. If that's the case, then come on. That's the predicament, isn't it? Yeah. That is the thinking predicament. And you can't avoid it. Well, what's good about it then? That's if right. It's best, <laughs> what's so That's good right. About it? Mm -hmm. if, if this can still be said to be best for things to be this way, then you have to in some way come up with some kind of argument or some kind of idea to show that even though this is the case it is all working for the good. Now how do you bridge it? Think of all the ideas, any idea you want, but that's your task. The idea of the United Nations is to eliminate war, theoretically. Okay, see, that's, that's the same argument of the Dostoevsky, the child. Like, it has been argued that uh, if, you, if you like the, what's sometimes called the calculus of suffering, that's the way they sometimes describe it, uh, the Jewish state in Israel could not have existed had not World War II taken the form that it did. That's right. And that whole hi historical iconoclastic movement, right? A terrible movement. Which is based on World War I. That's right. <laughs> That's right. But 
there has to have been some process going on, a transformation, that made the Jew wake up to the fact that there's certain myths he has to give up, and one of them is the suffering Jew. Modern Jew is not a Jew in terms of the ad old image. It cost, right, it cost six million lives to lose that image. Okay, now they have a, now that is a different type of mindset for a Jew today, obviously. Cost, six million. That's a calculus of suffering. Well then, wait a minute. There's an enormous price being paid for someone else's benefit, and that's not just. Now we have the suffering Palestinians. Right, now we have the, oh yeah, yeah. Now we have the dysphoria of the Palestinians, and so it goes. That's right, that's right, that's right. So, all right, how can we save it then? Transformation from within people has to be a change. Yeah, go ahead. The, the good would have to be greater than the, the many injustices. It would be a greater good. Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. Mm hmm. for good then if it's for a good go ahead then an injustice then injustice functions to benefit somehow so that's right the whole problem is the problem of whole and parts we're back to whole and parts and cause. Let's try it. If we, each of us, each of us is a unit, if we, each of us, is a unit, if that's what we are, a unit, a beginning, and an end, and that's our existence, then we can come to one conclusion. But if this is a part of our whole existence, go ahead, then we'd have to see the whole. We'd have to see the whole. Is. You have to see the whole. So the real question that man faces is, is our existence right now, our life, our existence now, the present existence we have, a part of a larger whole? Let me make an analogy. Each night you sleep and dream. <clears throat> What if each dream is a separate existence? You have no knowledge when you're in a dream <clears throat> of any other existence. As far as you're concerned, that's your whole existence. Then you wake up the next day and you say, good heavens, I can fit this dream into a whole string of dreams. <clears throat> it's just another one. Wait a minute, that I have. That I have. Uh-oh then what if man's existence right now, his present existence, is but a part a string of, lives. of a string of lives that we have to study? Pardon me? That we have to study or learn about. Or ah, mm -hmm. then wait a minute. Just as you might study each dream 
and learn something significant about each dream for your entire existence, for your entire existence, just as it may be important for you to study each dream so you can understand what it unfolds about your existence now and how it fits into your other dreams and how it fits into your waking world, then by heavens, it looks like you might be able to use that as an analogy and say, my existence here as Pierre Grimes I'm Pierre Grimes now, that's only a part, and therefore there may be other existences for this thing I call Pierre Grimes now, and therefore there might be a time then when I can function as a whole and look at each separate existence I have had to see whether I can study each one of my existences the way I study each of my dreams so I can find a particular intelligible pattern in it and learn from it from my own development. Ah, if that's the case, then is it possible that somewhere at some time we may be able to view our past lives and string them together? and find someone who is good, not on dream analysis, but life analysis? Right? If so, that person would have a very interesting art, would they not? Comparable to the dream analysis in our world. Mm. Now what does, see, this is saying that there are many parts we have. They may be connected, see, they may be connected. And just like each dream is separate and distinct and we can't recall a dream we had when we're dreaming, we can't, you ever have a dream where you recall a dream you had the night before? No, each one is private, separate. In the same way, each life is separate and distinct and you can't recall other lives until you wake up from your existence. You can't, that, you can recall different dreams when you wake up. Does that mean, therefore, you, when you wake up to the fact that you've had other existence, you can then line them up and study them? One, two, three, four? So that if you have a nightmare, look here, see, if you have a terrible dream, is it possible upon analysis that you may learn something very significant about it? Is it possible if you had a terrible life, you may wake up and discover something important about it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, if that's the case, if that's possible, see, we're just playing with an analogy with whole and parts. That's all we're doing. We're driven to that, aren't we? By what appears to be unjust unjust lives we've been given unjust dreams we've been given hmm. suppose someone came up to you and said you know what I think the whole universe is mad crazy because I have had a terrible dream what would you tell them let's <laughs> say yeah what? you suffered a lot in that dream that you had mm -hmm. truly you have right Good. What's the message it's What's the to message you? in the dream? What did you what can you learn from it? But that's only possible if you can wake up out of your dream and view it. Uh oh, if that's the case, go the other level. What are the messages that you can learn in terms of the injustices in the life? In that's your right. Life? That's right. Well, that suggests something curious then. If there is a learning that takes place through a series of dreams that can illuminate our present life, then through it we are getting a greater grasp of the nature of dreams and the way in which they appear in sequence and, and why certain themes reappear. Would you agree when you look at a series of dreams, certain themes reappear? 
Uh oh. Whatever you say here may be said here. It's sometimes said that you change or you, you go through many lives in one life, too. Surely. Surely. Many stages. That's right. That's right. So in, in that sense, in that sense, you may get an insight into a dream that is so profound that you're not going to get the kind that previously were in a cycle when you weren't able to understand it. But in understanding it, that may change all future dreams, may it not? That's right. It does. It happens. Uh-oh. Push it up here. Do it? Yeah. If you get a profound insight into a one, one life or a part of that one life, it would change um, the direction you go in all future. Therefore, you can change your own destiny on two levels, one through dreams and one through what might be regarded as a future lives. Yes. Reincarnations, if you want to call That's it. right. Or yeah, even yeah, in this life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you now, we're focusing on the meaning and the tr processes and the transformations of the particular forms that we take, don't we? Is that what we're doing? Mm. We're going back to this idea of part to whole because we want to know what is that whole of which we are truly a member. But right now, we're getting close to something curious. As you explore dreams in a series, it wakes up your own reflection. It makes you see something about your present existence, your present life. It gives you a greater grasp of what? Mm, who you are. Who you are? are. What you are. What you are. Why your things are happening like they are. Why things are happening the way they are. Why is it better? <laughs> good, good. Right now, push it up here. Why did? Yeah. You see, here you'll find the intelligibility for that part that you call yourself now. What would you be doing here? Finding the intelligibility in a series of lives, each of which may have its own lesson. Is that right? its own thing to learn. Is that correct? The whole thing, therefore, is a learning. And therefore, the full realization of that learning would it not bring us to this curious three words we left behind a short while ago. We would see, therefore, there is a purpose, that it's intelligible, and through our learning we gain an interesting kind of intelligence, not the kind that you need for running the stock market or building cars, but a different kind, right? And therefore, there's a more full use of intellect. On what level? Here. Understanding the whole. Understanding the whole. Ah. Ah, now look here. What if it were possible to gain this kind of insight here in your present existence. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then that would speed up <laughs> as well as <laughs> yep. would it not? Yep. That's right. That's right. You get a good insight into that intelligence. And you would have to see, would you not agree, the basic thing you'd have to see over and over again, the thing you, every man wants to see, every person in the world wants to see, every person who's ever been born wants to see. The best. The good. That everything should be exactly where it is best for it to be. That's what you really want to see. For if you can see that, that means the universe is justice. justice. And we're not going to stop until we find that out. Mm -hmm. We're not going to stop. Incredible. That's our goal. Yeah. That's where man is going. There was a book <coughs> written about 10 or 15 years ago called 2150. 
all the 21 footprints. And he claimed that we're living all the, the future and the present and the past all simultaneously. Hmm. So if everything is one and everything is happening, so he would jump into the future life and into a past life and hmm. Hmm. played around with the whole uh, yeah. thing. Yeah. I found it logical, but a little hard to uh, <laughs> digest. I thought you had reference to something else once called the 52 Club. Not many of us remember that. <clears throat> yes, now look. I'd like to do something now. You see, the going by the way we're going, there is one thing that's essential for this to be the way it should be and the way it's best for all things. And that is, would you not agree, the thing that's most important is learning. That has to be central to the entire universe. And learning about ourselves. Nothing else. Learning about ourselves. Transforming ourselves through learning. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can be transformed by learning about yourself, then those states of mind where you gain <clears throat> the, what you might regard, let's say, let us say we can place them hierarchically, let us say we can place insights into the self hierarchically. That's the highest, etc. Would it not be interesting if we can present them in this way that we could say these insights into the self, into oneself, are they related to anything? And if so, what? Look here. Suppose these things are nothing other than degrees to which a person can be said to become enlightened because you become enlightened about yourself and the nature of reality. Well then, if that's the case, you're going to get insights into yourself. Wait a minute. But then that's a growing learning. And what you're learning is the degree to which you can say there's intelligence governing the universe. Wait a minute. No, 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 no. Then insights in the self based upon learning about the nature of the self brings you face to face with the fact that there is intelligibility in the universe, an intelligence that cares and an intellect that is functioning for the good of all. Uh, if that can be correlated now, going back to this idea of different degrees of enlightenment, like in the ox herding pictures, or the Tibetans have 25 categories, Tozan has five, the patriarch Tozan, has five categories. <clears throat> Plato has seven, four divisions. Then we might be able to say then, to the degree to which we can wake up our own processes of enlightenment, to that degree we're speeding up the entire evolution of man. Wow, well, wait a minute then. Then in the enlightenment quest, we are in fact anticipating the future development of man. Or, we are living through the entire process, what's it called? Recapitulation of ontology. They used to call it biology recapitulates ontology, remember? But this would be saying then that man, <clears throat> as he seeks greater and greater degrees of self-discovery, self-knowledge, is doing nothing other than learning how learning plays a role in the nature of reality of which he is part and parcel, and that gives him an insight into the nature of the intelligible, the existence of intelligence working for the highest good. If that can be said, then we're living in a just world in which everything is the way it should be for our learning, and that's to our benefit. And this is where it goes, doesn't it? So everything is fine just as it is. <laughs> <laughs> From what, what? No. Everything is fine just as it is. Because we're all now there's a trivial sense to this, which Voltaire, of course, picked up. 
right? But this is only on the highest metaphysical level where this functions. It's not on the trivial level. Right, right, right. Yeah. So therefore, let me now uh, Okay. I want to go back to our questions. Before we threw them out, why does it exist? Now we can go back to whys. Now we can go, we can use the whys now, can't we? Now we can use the whys. Hey, why is there existence? Why, does, why do you and I exist? For learning. Ah. Why, why did you and I come into existence? It was time to learn something. Right. So then the entire universe then, through our existence, is turning upon itself to discover itself. Therefore, one discovers in this that the nature of reality is best, therefore there is goodness. If it's best. Ah, if there's that possibility, this only works under one condition. And that is there must be that ability and the, at the very heart of, of reality to turn upon itself, self-discovery. That's called essence. Or what we call in Greek, usia. Right? That ability of reality to turn upon itself and reflect upon itself. Now, for, for that to be present, that means we're face to face with a kind of existence that always is. That is, we want that whole, we want that whole in which we can see our highest part functioning most ideally. And that's when we're learning. Wait a minute, when we're learning, therefore, on this level of self-discovery, we are in fact ut utilizing the highest level of our own intelligence, freeing the highest part of our own intellect to grasp the nature of reality and discovering its intelligible basis. Oh. When you do that, you see, if I can just go one more step, if one now reaches this level, this level, sees the whole thing intelligible, at once, sees the whole intelligible at once. If you can see the whole intelligible at once, see? If you can see the whole, right? Intelligible at once, that's what in it, intuition is, insight, see the whole intelligible at once. Well, then there isn't any difference between what's intelligible and the intellect and the intelligence. They're one. Therefore, one grasps. So if you can see this all at once, then you're seeing its oneness. You're seeing its oneness, necessarily. You're seeing its oneness. Hey, if you're seeing its oneness, you see, now you have the capacity of the reality to turn upon itself, essence or usia. You know that it's good, but to, to be able to grasp it all at once in a oneness, to see that it always is the way it is, best for it to be the way it is. What always is, another word for that in Greek is eternity. Aeon. Oh, always is. Right, aeon, right? Right? What always is. Therefore, in this culminating experience, one has to see the nature of reality as good, goodness at the very core of it, brought about by a turning about and seeing into the nature of oneself, into the nature of reality. And therefore, one grasps what always one sees the intelligible all at once in its totality as a oneness, always is eternity. Therefore, there are three major ideas necessarily: eternity, essence, and goodness. 
So what? Ah, ah, look, look, look here. They're rather curious, you see. We see then the need for these three terms, right? Essence, that ability to turn upon itself, goodness, <clears throat> and eternity. These are the three primary ideas. These are the three primal ideas, the most fundamental ideas in metaphysics. They're called the trium, the primary ideas from which everything else proceeds. They give a name to this trion, these three. I uh, wonder what it is now. Maybe I can think of it. They call it the primal cause. This is the primal cause. In other words, at the heart of reality, at the very heart and core of reality, there is a vast integrity which exhibits itself as goodness, as that goodness which always is, and it has the capacity to turn upon itself and see itself in that very way in the most brilliant light of being. What's that called? Primal cause. Therefore, we have concluded our search for the cause. <laughs> Say, everything is revealed as it is now. Everything is realized as it is now. Mm -hmm. Everything is enlightened as it is now. Well, I enjoyed the trip. But the goal of the universe is to look upon that, to dis to, to to turn around and see that. Uh huh. Yeah, there's no better time to see it. Will always be there. I was in a discussion just recently and some people were sitting around there saying, well, that, that puts a heavy burden on us. I said, yeah, but if you have nothing else to do, the best thing to do, you know, is to get enlightened. Right? You think so? If you have nothing else to do, you might as well get enlightened. Right. <laughs> Unless you can find something better. <laughs> no. <laughs> Well, I thank you for letting me take you through this. I've uh, had this in my reflections for a while, and that's one of the reasons I put it up here as one of the talks to have, because I wanted to go through it, share it. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. My pleasure. My pleasure. I just have to work and see how I can work all the time. When I'm working in all the things that I'm doing, how that all fits in here. The goodness of it, the essence. Well, every problem is your koan. Life gives us koans, life gives us problems to solve. That's what life is. If you're, you confront your problems, you confront problems. In this game, therefore, problems would be anticipated, expected. It doesn't mean you like them, but it does mean that you may learn from them, and that's what we're here for. That's a Platonic. This, of course, all comes from Plato. I need, of course, should have said that earlier. So our painkiller is ethical then. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, no. You, you can have a painkiller, but you want to look at why you suffer. You want to look at the suffering. The pain is physiological. Right? Right. The pain is physiological. That's real, and that's normal. But the suffering is what we add to it. That's what we want to see. Pain is survival. If you sit on attack, you'd like to know about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
And many people go through pain and uh, later accept it as an easy price to pay for wherever childbirth, all those things that are most significant. But thank you. Thank you.